indeed, and a very welcome, warm welcome to all of you who are joining from this Zoom session from wherever you may be on this planet. Uh, indeed, the fame of these OZ firesides or Whitehead firesides has spread so far and wide that uh, may soon extend beyond our planet. I talked about that a couple of weeks ago, so I'm a, very, a topic very close to me, close to my heart. And thanks to the tireless effort of the team behind it to make it so successful. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce someone I know well, in fact, quite well. Professionally, Faraday is professor of cognitive neuroscience at University College London and the Great Ormond Street Institute of Child Health. She is also the clinical academic lead for the Department of Neuropsychology at Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children. Her research is focused on early brain injury and the development of brain circuits that underpin human attributes, such as episodic memory and speech and language. She was part of the team that identified the FOXP2 gene in 2001, the so-called speech for gene, speech for language, that also explains why humans talk and chimps do not. She is also credited with the discovery of the amnesic syndrome in children. As for her family background, she is one of 17 living great-great-grandchildren of Haji Mullah Mehdi of Yazd, a person you will hear about a lot more tonight. She is also one of the <clears throat> three daughters of the last hand of the cause of God and trustee of Allah, Dr. Ali Muhammad Barqa. No further ado, I'll pass on to Farani. Over to you, Farani. Good evening, dear friends and family, uh, near and far. It is such a pleasure for me to be seeing so many of you gathered here to listen to the transgenerational life stories of three members of the Varga family. Our aim in choosing this very personal topic for our fireside today was to look back to the past two centuries and become inspired by the stories of the early believers of the Baha'i faith, whose lives became transformed when they heard about the new religion. They embraced the new message, not only with their minds, but also their hearts and their souls. Before I start our story, <clears throat> I wanted to thank my dear husband, Ramin Khadem, who has helped me enormously by putting together the material for this presentation and also for chairing the session. I also wanted to let you know that my two dear sisters, Elahe Varga Shmael from upstate New York and Nadia Varga Maitsu from Vancouver, Canada are both online with us. So perhaps they can also contribute to the discussion during the question and answer session. One last comment before I start. I'll be sharing with you some codes and tablets, some of which have been translated from the original Persian or Arabic languages. These are not official translations, but they are shared with you today to give a flavor of the emotions they inspire. I will now start by taking you back about a century and a half to late 1870s in Iran and begin our story with a short video clip. Jonu 
During the rule of the Ottoman Empire, many Baha'is made the long pilgrimage to Akko to attain the presence of Baha'u'llah. While staying in the mansion of Mazroi in the proximity of Akko, Mullah Mehdi Atri, a perfume merchant from the Persian city of Yazd, came in the company of his two sons to pay homage to their beloved. A frail old man who had partially lost his sight, he could only hope to feel the warmth of the presence of the Promised One and to hear his heavenly voice. Such was not to be. After an arduous journey of several months into Iraq on foot, through mountainous terrain, and with the further hardship of imprisonment along the way, he had used his last ounce of energy and could only manage to walk to the perimeter of Mazroi, where he fell ill and passed away. I will now pick up from here to show you the sketch of Mazroi, which is where Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith, would spend some time when he was allowed to leave the nearby prison city of Akka. When Baha'u'llah heard about the unfulfilled pilgrimage of Haji Mehdi, he was so touched by the dedication of this old man that he would often stop by his gravesite, rest his foot on Haji Mehdi's grave, and say prayers for the progress of his soul. Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, later built with his own hands this memorial grave, which is now situated in the public cemetery, and composed the following inscription, which reads, He is eternal. Verily, Haji Mehdi found guidance in the burning fire on Mount Sinai and responded to the call attracted by the concourse on high. Before continuing with our story going forward, let me take you back to the mid 1840s and tell you a few details about Haji Mehdi and his family who were living in Yazd, shown here in the circle in the central part of Iran. Having heard about the declaration of the Bab, the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, Haji Mehdi had originally converted from Islam to become a Babi. Some years later, he traveled to Iraq, where Baha'u'llah was in exile, and recognized the station as the one whom God shall make manifest. Subsequently, Haji Mehdi returned to his native city of Yazd and taught the faith to his wife, their only daughter, Bibi Tuba, and their three sons, Hussein, Hassan, and the youngest, Ali Muhammad. He became so inflamed with the newfound faith that he started to openly teach the new religion to his fellow citizens in Yazd, and was consequently bastinado, shown here on the left side of the screen, and exiled from his native city. He took his eldest son, Hussein, and his youngest, Ali Muhammad, with him, and the party set on foot to travel to Tabriz, the city in the northwestern part of Iran, shown here on the map. The exile party arrived in Tabriz, a region ruled by the Shah Savan tribe, again shown on the top le left side of the screen. This is a large nomadic tribe that occupied much of the region seen here on the map. At this time, Ali Muhammad would have been only in his early 20s. But he was erudite, as they used to say, he was silver tongued and with expertise in the old tradition of herbal medicine. The party was received by Mirza Abdullah Khan Nuri, a devout Baha'i who was the chief attendant of the crown prince to the Qajar king, Nasreddin Shah. 
the wealthy and powerful wife of Mirza Abdullah Khan was the daughter of the ruler of the Shah Savan tribe. She was a devout Muslim and a staunch enemy of the Babi and the Baha'i followers. She did not know that her husband had already become a follower of the new religion. This Shah Savan wife of Mirza Abdullah Khan was a colorful character. The story goes that when the Shah visited the tribe with his regiment of about a hundred soldiers, she cooked a separate dish for each person and then prepared for the king an egg stuffed within a chicken, which was in turn stuffed within a turkey and then within a lamb and finally all wrapped up within a bowl of rice. Enchanted by the character, the poetic talents and medicinal expertise of the young Ali Muhammad, Mirza Abdullah Khan persuaded his wife to give the hand of their only daughter, Fatima Khanum, in marriage to the youngest. After the marriage of the couple, Haji Mehdi, along with Mirza Hussein, Mirza Ali Muhammad, and the new father-in-law set out on pilgrimage towards Akka. Now we go back and pick up the story once again from after the passing of Haji Mehdi in Mazra'e, which you saw a little while ago. The two sons of Haji Mehdi continued their journey and had the honor of attaining the presence of Baha'u'llah and were showered with his love. In the next slide, the impact of this first pilgrimage on Ali Muhammad was to transform him into a new creation. A poet of outstanding caliber and a physician of traditional Persian medicine, he was bestowed the title of Varga by Baha'u'llah. In Arabic, Varga means dove. Varga later adopted this name as his family name and often used it as a pen name in his poetry. Varga recounted that on one occasion, when he was in the presence of Baha'u'llah, a verse of the Quran flashed through his mind as he gazed in adoration upon the countenance of Baha'u'llah. Seeking confirmation of Baha'u'llah's station as the manifestation of God, he wished that Baha'u'llah might repeat that same verse. During his discourse, Baha'u'llah recited that same verse in its entirety. Stunned, Varga thought to himself that perhaps that had been a pure coincidence. At that very instant, Baha'u'llah abruptly turned to him saying, was this not a sufficient proof for you? After their pilgrimage, Baha'u'llah instructed the brothers to return to Iran. Mirza Hussein, sitting in the middle row to the extreme right, to me on Doab, shown in red in the top map, and Varga sitting next to his brother in the white robe to Tabriz, which is shown in the bottom map in red, with the mission to spread the teachings of the faith. Varga returned to Persia as a flame of fire and spread the message to all he met in small and large gatherings, as we see in these two photographs that were taken in those early days. <clears throat> on the left side of the screen, you see Varga sitting on the, to the right, and on the picture to the side, you see a large gathering of the friends in Iran. Varga is sitting to the right again. He was often persecuted and prosecuted by the authorities for his teaching activities and spent much of his time in prison on various charges of inciting the public. At the same time that he was involved in his teaching activities, 
he was also developing his poetic skills, rapidly becoming known as an outstanding Baha'i poet of his time. It's estimated that the collection of Varro's poetry is in excess of 6,000 verses, only half of which have been classified and copied. Varro's poetic style comprised virtually all structures typical of Persian poetry. And the theme of his poems are testimonials to his total dedication to Baha'u'llah and his son, Abdul Baha. You heard a sample of this at the start of this presentation. During the 10 to 12 years after his first pilgrimage and return to Tabriz, Varga and his wife Fatima formed a family unit while living in the home of the fanat fanatical mother-in-law, which was of course a custom at the time. Varga and his wife had four sons, Azizullah, Ruhullah, Waliullah, and Badiullah. This picture shows Varga's first two sons, Azizullah at the tender age of six on the left, and Ruhullah at the age of three years. From an early age, Varga instilled in his sons the love and dedication to Baha'u'llah and his teachings. His zeal unquenched, Varga set out once again to return to the Holy Land, to attain the presence of Baha'u'llah a second time. This second pilgrimage would have taken place sometime around 1891. This time, Varga was accompanied by his two sons, Azizullah, shown on the left, and Ruhullah, shown on the right, they would have been young children at the time. From a young age, Ruhollah was an erudite thinker. And like his father, he was endowed with poetic talents of a high caliber. His most well-known published poem, written in Masnavi style, consists of 40 couplets. Ruhollah was also an avid teacher of the Baha'i faith and was given the title of Janab Mubalek, which in Persian means the honorable teacher by Baha'u'llah. We will now watch a short video clip of an account involving the young Ruhullah when he was on pilgrimage. It is recounted by the greatest holy leaf, the daughter of Baha'u'llah, that once in a gathering in this house attended by Ruhullah and two sons of Baha'u'llah, she had asked Ruhullah, how do you teach the faith? By saying that God has manifested himself, the nine-year-old boy replied. Surely you couldn't say such a thing straight out to people, she demurred. I don't say it to everybody, Ruhullah responded. I only say it to those who have a capacity to hear such a statement. And how do you know such people, she inquired. I look into their eyes and then I know whether I can give them the message. Laughing heartily, she beckoned him to come closer to her. Look into my eyes then, she said. He sat across from the greatest holy leaf and looked intently into her eyes. You're already a believer, he finally announced. She pointed to the sons of Baha'u'llah. Look into the eyes of those two boys. After gazing at them searchingly, he sadly said, it's not worth the effort. Those two sons of Baha'u'llah in later years joined hands with the arch covenant breaker of the faith, Mirza Muhammad Ali. While on his second pilgrimage, Baha'u'llah expounded on the qualities of Abdul Baha and his possession of a magnetism and the most great elixir that spreads across the world. Barra became so transfixed by Baha'u'llah's personage and his utterances, and so moved by the example of Abdul Baha, that he pleaded for martyrdom in the path of Abdul Baha. When he returned to Persia, Varga renewed his plea for martyrdom for himself and on behalf of one of his sons. 
Baha'u'llah acquiesced. The young Ruhollah long, the wrong, the young Ruhollah's longing and despair caused by separation from his beloved is made clear in the following letter addressed to Abdul Baha and penned in his beautiful calligraphy. But for a moment in your presence, I suffer a lifetime of anguish in separation. I beseech the blessed beauty to set free this mortal bird from its cage of separation, so to reach the rose garden of reunion. Signed, the lowest of the servants of God, Ruhullah. Barba and his sons made one final pilgrimage to Akka in 1893, this time after the passing of Baha'u'llah during the ministry of Abdul Baha. In the next slide, while traveling towards Yaz to visit his sister Bibi Tuba, Barba and his son Ruhullah became imprisoned with chains around their necks, along with two other Baha'is as shown in this picture. Subsequently, Varga was martyred in the prison cell in front of his 12-year-old son. Ruhollah was offered his life and all means of comfort if he recanted his faith, but he refused, crying that he wanted to join his father. Whereupon the young boy of 12 was strangled to death. Abdel Baha was so moved by their examples that in their, in their eulogy, he bestowed unparalleled love and praise in their honor. He later elevated Varga to the rank of hand of the cause of God. Varga was one of four individuals to be so honored posthumously during the ministry of Abdel Baha. Subsequently, in the early part of the 20th century, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, Shoghi Effendi, designated Varga as one of the apostles of Baha'u'llah. In this next slide, you see the newspaper report that documents the details of the barbaric actions of the jailer, shown on the top left, and the details of the events as reported by an eyewitness present in the prison cell. In the next slide, you see the mausoleum that was built later for Varga and Ruhollah in Varga'iye, situated outside of Tehran. And in this slide, you see the burial site of the father and son, along with the remains of the wife of Varga, Fatima Khanum, and mother of the mother of Ruhollah, situated in the Baha'i cemetery. Now you will recall that Varga had three sons other than Ruhollah. The youngest, Badiullah, had died when he was a young child. And so after the martyrdom of uh, Varga and Ruhollah, Abdul Baha took under his wings the two remaining sons of Varga and showered them with his love, directing them and instructing them as they developed. In a tablet, Abdul Baha addresses the two brothers. Agha Mirza Azizullah Khan and Agha Mirza Valiullah Khan, upon them be the glory of glories. He is God. O ye two lighted candles, praise be to God that from his station of supreme martyrdom, his honor Varga is the means for divine blessings and bounties to surround his two illumined sons as he begs on your behalf, divine assistance and heavenly protection and confirmation. Although for a period there was no communication outwardly between us, but the signs of divine love were firmly engraved in our hearts. Thus your absence was like unto your presence, and even while you were away, you were both remembered in spirit. 
This is an unofficial translation from the Arabic. Hand side of the screen, you see a picture of um, Azizullah, and on the right, it's a picture of both brothers together. Abdul Baha instructed Azizullah to attend the American school in Tehran and study English and French. In time, Azizullah became quite influential in Persian society and became the director of a major bank. He was elected to the first spiritual assembly of the Baha'is of Tehran and received regular directives from Abdul Baha. Azizullah also assumed responsibility for his younger brother, Valiullah, who was about four years younger than him. This next reading is from the biography of Valiullah, the younger brother, describing his life after the martyrdom of his father and brother in his own words, and Ramin is going to read it. My grandmother had such a deep hatred of the cause that she began to make evil suggestions to me against my father and to sow the seeds of hatred and enmity in my soul against him. She was able to impress my tender soul to such an extent that in my Islamic prayers, which I was obliged to say, I wept in bitter grief for my father's deviation and which had earned him so much hatred from the public. Upon the age of 16, I lived with my grandmother in an atmosphere charged with such fanaticism and hatred towards the cause. Then my uncle, Haji Mirza Hussein, a sincere believer and teacher of the cause, took steps to transfer me from Tabriz to Mianduab, where I lived under his care and love for some years until I became a believer. On the instructions of the master, Abdul Baha, Valiullah moved to Tehran to live with his brother. Sometime later, their mother, Fatima, became a Baha'i and left Tabriz for Tehran to live with her sons in the family home. Valiullah, shown here on the left-hand side, attended the American school in Tehran studying English. Later, he continued his studies at the American College in Beirut and served Abdul Baha in Haifa during the summer breaks from school. In the next slide, you will see a tablet which shows the bond of love for Valiullah. The tablet is from Abdul Baha and it's written in the poetic form. And this was written to him when he was away during the school term. And it says in English, O thou who art the valley of the mighty, the almighty. Separation is prolonged and yearning hath increased. Ere long, your countenance I shall see. And I will cull flowers from the garden of thy presence. O valley, my dearly cherished one. This is a shortened version of it, but it conveys the, the sentiment. In his early 20s, Valiullah married Bahia Khanum, daughter of Atollah Atai, a very influential person in the Shah's court, who was given the title of Sanya Sultan by the Shah for his artistic accomplishments. In the next slide, we see a picture of Sanya Sultan along with some examples of his paintings. Sanyo Sultan is shown in the middle, in the top middle portion of the slide. The lowest picture in this slide, in the center, was recently auctioned at the auction house Christie's as an example of Qajar period art. In 1912, Valiullah accompanied Abdul Baha on his historic journey to America and acted as his interpreter on numerous occasions. It was during this momentous trip in America that Valiullah's wife gave birth to their first son. 
Azizullah, who had stayed behind in Iran, had a picture taken of himself holding on his lap his infant nephew, shown here on the left-hand side of the slide. Turning the photograph on the back of it, shown in the middle panel of the slide, Azizullah inscribed the following message to his brother, Valiullah, and sent the picture to the address in New York. The transcription read, this picture of the apple of mine eyes, my beloved nephew, taken when he was six months old, six months and 10 days old, is sent to his father, Mirza Valiullah Khan of Arqa, who's accompanying the master Abdul Baha in America so that he may at an opportune moment beseech our beloved to pray for this sapling, to dedicate himself to him in the path of service to the cause of God. When the picture was shown to Abdul Baha by one of the Baha'is then present, he wrote on one hand, Yad, and on the other, Mu'ayyad, meaning confirmed hand. He then inscribed Allah Pa on the chest and Ya Baha'u'llah Pa above his head. Regrettably, some of these inscriptions in ink have faded over time. Abdul Baha then confirmed the name Ali Muhammad in memory of the boy's martyred grandfather, Mirza Ali Muhammad Varqa. The significance of this photograph lay hidden to everyone, even family members, for decades, although it was being treasured in the family's chest of precious souvenirs from the beloved master. We shall return to this story later on. Abdul Baha continued to shower the two brothers with his love, providing guidance and directives for their lives. They accompanied the master during his travels in Europe and are both seen here in Paris beneath the Eiffel Tower. Azizullah is the fourth person from the right and Valiullah is on the extreme left, standing next to the bearded gentleman. We see the love that Abdul Baha bore the brothers. O oh, Valiullah, thy brother aboard our ship has brought paper and pen and asked me to send thee a souvenir from this vessel. The sea is turbulent, nevertheless I'm writing. Notice how dear thou art that despite this turbulence, I'm calling thee to mind and holding you in remembrance. Signed, Ain Ain, which is the initials of Abdul Baha. In the next slide, Janab of Arqa and his wife Bahia had 10 children, seven of whom survived to reach adulthood. In this picture, you see the young Ali Muhammad at the age of four, standing in front of his uncle, Azizullah, with his younger brother Mehdi, named after his great-great-grandfather, Haji Mehdi Yazdi, whom you heard about at the beginning of this presentation, Mehdi being held in the arms of his father, Valiullah. In the next slide, you see the young family of Valiullah with the first four of the children present in this picture. Abdul Baha, addressed a letter to this group of family members, which reads as follows. Through Azizullah Khan of Arghal, to Valiullah Khan, his mother, and Ali Muhammad Khan, Mehdi Khan, Malihe Khanu, and Munira Khan. Upon them be the glory of glories. O ye relatives of his honor, the martyr. Those well-assured souls are deeply by Abdul Baha, for you are all related to and grown out of the tree of that distinguished martyr and are being watered and nurtured by the outpourings of the cloud of God's covenant. 
I cherish the hope that each one of you may further illumine the lamp of that eminent martyr and inspired by his example, will change this human realm into a deductible rose garden. Whenever I recall the meekness of that illustrious soul, I raise cries of lamentation, shed tears of grief, and beseech for you all divine assistance and bounty. Upon you be the glory of glories. Haifa. On the right panel, you see a picture of Waliullah and Bahia Khanum's entire family during their later years with all seven of their adult children. Having served at the Russian legation, Janab Varga then occupied the position of first secretary at the Turkish High Commission in Tehran. This is Waliullah Varga now that we're talking about. He was elected to the first National Assembly of the Baha'is of Iran, on which he served until his passing in 1955 in Germany. In the next slide, in 1938, on the passing of Janab Amin Amin, the third trustee of Kuruk, the guardian of the Baha'i faith, Shoghi Effendi, appointed Janab Valiullah Varga as the trustee of Kuruk in order to devote, devote his time fully to the work of Hurula, the right of God, he later left his post at the Turkish High Commission. In 1951, Valiullah Varga was amongst the first contingent of the hands of the cause of God to be appointed by the guardian. And at the request of the guardian, he attended in 1953 the Intercontinental Conferences of Kampala, Chicago, Stockholm, and New Delhi. The beloved guardian was saddened by the passing of this outstanding hand of the cause after a period of illness, indicating that his shining record of services extending over half a century would enrich the annals of heroic formative age of Baha'i dispensation. After a very long illness, Valiullah Varga passed away in Germany, where he had been receiving treatment. In a cablegram, the beloved guardian indicates that the Baha'i community of Germany is blessed for having received his dust. This slide that you're watching shows the funeral procession and the grave of Valiullah that was constructed on the instructions of the guardian. On the passing of his father, the guardian elevated Ali Muhammad to the rank of hand of the cause of God and also to the position of trusteeships of Hurugullah, the right of God. It was only at this point in time that the significance of the photograph Abdul Baha signed in 1912 became known. An account of the story behind this photograph was published in Payama Baha'i, a publication of the community of the Baha'i community in Iran. Dr. Lutfullah Hakim, who was at the time the Guardian Secretary, requested a copy of the photograph to be sent from Iran to be presented to the guardian. Amat al-Baha Ruhiya Khanum, the guardian's spouse, who was present on the occasion, recounted that the beloved guardian, unaware of the existence of the photo, examined it carefully and then smiled approvingly. And so it was that an appointment that had been confirmed but, but had been conferred by Abdul Baha on Ali Muhammad as a baby was executed by the beloved guardian some 43 years later. As a child, Ali Muhammad was raised lovingly, spending much of the time with his father and uncle Mirza Azizullah. In this photo on the left, he's sitting between his father and his uncle Azizullah. On the right, you see a picture of him 
while he attended the Tarbiyat School for Boys, which was established by the Baha'is, and also attended um, the Friday Baha'i Dar Sakhlaq School, which literally means study of manners. Along in this picture, he's seen along with other children gathered together in a group picture, and Ali Muhammad is sitting on the top right. Young Ali Muhammad completed his secondary education at the Dar al Funun. Uh, and then, as required, he served for a period of time in the army, obtaining the rank of third lieutenant in the artillery. In his early 20s, he married Rouhanie Mohtadi, and their marriage produced three daughters. The young couple had shared interest in music, they both played the violin, and they loved poetry. Our mother had the most melodious voice and would often be heard chanting prayers and songs while going about her daily affairs. Ali Muhammad undertook teaching posts in schools in Tehran and then Mashhad and Shiraz before returning to Tehran to pursue his higher education. He obtained undergraduate degrees in history and economics from the University of Tehran and then he became one of a few chosen by the Iranian government to pursue graduate studies abroad. He studied in Paris at the Sorbonne and after obtaining his doctorate, Dr. Varga returned to Iran, eventually becoming a leading professor at the University of Tehran, where he was widely popular among students and staff members alike. While carrying out his professional duties at the university, Dr. Varga worked alongside his father in his spare time, supporting him in his war responsibilities. Until this day, November 15th in 1955, when the Baha'i world was informed of his appointment as the trustee and hand of the cause. And what a coincidence it is that we are remembering him on this very special day today because Exactly on this day today, the Baha'i daily calendar shows that Ali Muhammad Varga was appointed to this uh, position. In the next slide, you see Mrs. Rohania Varga always supporting her husband. This is our mother who passed away in Montreal, Canada in 2001 after a long illness. As a hand of the cause, um, Dr. Varga represented the Universal House of Justice at many national conventions around the world, particularly the French speaking countries. In more re recent years, he represented the House of Justice at the first national convention of Eastern European countries and was present at the election of a number of national assemblies, including the first national assembly of Greenland, Belarus, Moldova, and Ukraine. I remember one day sitting with him and counting the number of countries that he had visited during his life, and it totaled 65. It was pretty impressive. In the next slide, you see that in his capacity as the trustee of Hurugullah, he focused on education the worldwide Baha'i community in the law of Hurug and examining its spiritual aspects. During the 52 years of his stewardship as the trustee, the evolution and advance of the mighty law of Hukullah has been simply breathtaking. At the start of the period, the law was applicable um, to the believers in Persia and those residing in neighboring countries. At the end of this period, the law is practiced universally by Baha'is everywhere. Dr. Varga moved his residence to the Holy Land in 1996. Here he's seen on the left of the slide, sitting in the garden of Rizwan outside of Bahji. After the passing of Amat al-Bahar Ruhi in 2001 and Mr. Furutan in 2004, Dr. Ali Muhammad Varga became the last hand of the cause of God the institution that Baha'u'llah had established about 
a century and a half ago. This is one of the last photographs of Dr. Ali Muhammad Varga taken in his home with all nine members of the Universal House of Justice in, separate, in celebration of No Ruse in March 2006. And this slide shows one of our favorite slides of our father, showing him in his home, sitting by the window in what he referred to as his garden, overlooking the Haifa Bay. The Varga family has the distinct honor of having to its name a succession of three generations of hands of the cause of God and two generations of trustees of Hurugullah. This extraordinary blessing owes its good fortune to the pure and selfless Mullah Mehdi Atri, who first set out on foot with his sons to attain the presence of the promised one of all ages some 140 years ago. What transpired thereafter is indeed the source of legend. Thank you very much to our very eloquent speaker who's done a tremendous job.